Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, everybody's looking refreshed this evening, even if it's been a long day. Um, and uh, it's great to have you here. And it's particularly good to have our colleagues from New South Wales here. Um, not quite sure how many people need to make the distinction between New South Wales and Victoria who are coming online, but I guess they can figure it out. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge the land that I'm on and people in, in Melbourne are on, which is the land of the Wurrung people here in um, Brunswick West. But uh, I know that um, our presenters are in New South Wales and so they might like to just briefly introduce themselves and tell us where they're, um, what country they're coming from. Would you like to start, Brona, since you're up, your face is there. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Heather. Uh, so uh, I'll say Giazich, uh, August Falcher Road, which in my mother tongue, in Nilaga, in Irish, is uh, hello, of course, and uh, welcome to you. And of course, up in Sydney, uh, I'm presenting here on the land of the traditional owners, the Darug people. So I wanted to share a few thoughts and tell you a little bit about uh, the work that I've been doing. And I'll start off by saying I'm academic. Uh, I primarily work in research roles at the minute, and I've been doing that for about 10 years or so. And there's this wonderful line from Campbell and Murray in a paper back in 2004, I think, uh, where they wrote that the role of research is not only to try and understand the world, but to engage with the possibilities for changing it. Now, there is simply not enough time uh, for me to tell you about the ways in which uh, I feel like I, I perhaps haven't been able to live up to that, but it's some certainly something uh, I aspire to do in my work. So I've been in Australia about uh, 10 years. I'm from Ireland originally. And uh, when I came here, I came to study my PhD at a regional university. And since then, and over that time, I've become acutely aware and very passionate about uh, geographical disparities and how they relate to health and well-being. Now, about a third of the population in Australia live outside of the major cities or the sort of metropolitan areas. And essentially, we classify that in terms of population uh, density. So I'll be saying words like rural, regional, and remote. And for residents in these communities, there are generally poor health outcomes, as well as more limited access to services and generally just more services, uh, more, pardon me, more limited services generally. So in terms of I'm just going to interrupt you there, Brona, sorry, because I just want to very quickly get an introduction from each person before we go into a bit more detail, if that's okay. Yeah, um, sure. Yep, yep. So I'll just ask Marley to introduce herself too, if we can. Thank you. Hello, I'll just unmute, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Marley Bauer, also in Sydney, um, like Bruna said, although I'm on the land of the Gadigal people, the Aura Nation, and um, I'm currently doing research at the Middle Tilda Centre for research in mental health and substance use. Great, and you have some lovely trees waving in the background there, which we're going to be hypnotised by. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marley. And uh, Meg is an old friend of community psychology in, in Sydney. Would you like to introduce yourself? You need to unmute to do that. You there, Meg? She was there. Apologies, people. I'm just throwing a cat out. Um, <laughs> a bit of behaviour modification going on here. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Meg Smith. Um, I'm also bringing in from the Gadigal country of the Eora Nation, which are the Indigenous peoples of the Sydney region. Um, my area of research is mental health and mental illness, in particular bipolar disorder. Um, and I actually got a PhD topic out of it. It's like, well, if you're going to be obsessed with a particular area of social justice, you might as well get a PhD. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so some of the issues for me is I'll be looking at how you connect people up who have come from a really stigmatised um, background. So that's me. 
Great. Thank you, Meg. Yeah. And uh, Wafa. Assalamu alaikum. Masa al khair. Good evening or good day to you, depending on where you are. Um, I'm joining you from um, Darug land in Western Sydney, and I'd like to pay my respects to Indigenous leaders uh, and communities, past, present, and emerging in Australia and anywhere else, everywhere else. So I'm going to be talking about my research with um, Australian Muslim communities uh, over the last 35 years. Excellent. We're already looking forward to that. Thank you, Wafa. And last but not least is Elizabeth Conroy. Hello. Um, I'm, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a senior research fellow at the Translational Health Research Institute in Western Sydney University. Normally, I work on Darul land in southwestern Sydney, but tonight I am presenting on the lands of the Darren Kingdom people um, about an hour or so north of Sydney. Great. That's brilliant. So these are the people who are going to be presenting. I'm just chairing and um, uh, because I'm in Melbourne and uh, but I just wanted to say a few words first of a little bit about some background to community psychology in New South Wales, because I think probably Meg and I have been around it for roughly the same time. But um, New South Wales, for those who don't know, is Australia's most populous state and has the second largest um, number of members of the College of Community Psychologists, perhaps surprisingly, but that is still a very small number. Um, and uh, a number of these people are researchers or practitioners in community settings with backgrounds in, in other areas of psychology or indeed from other disciplines like sociology or criminology or education, medicine, community development, and based at some distance from one another in sprawling Sydney and throughout the state. So um, there was actually, there has actually been a lengthy community psychology presence in New South Wales, starting back in, I think it was the 70s and 80s with Sid Engelberg, who's now um, in Israel, um, but uh, and was originally from the United States. Um, but there's never been a formally accredited community psychology program in New South Wales. Um, although obviously there have been some people who have been doing uh, individual research or even in teams. So that has meant that it has been difficult to have a community of community psychologists in, in Sydney. And I particularly want to pay tribute to Meg here because she's been pretty much the, the link person right through about more than 30 years um, with different other people coming and going. And it's lovely to have you here, Meg. Um, speaking of our own elders, we, which is probably me as well, I guess. Um, so we, um, <clears throat> it's pretty obvious and it will be obvious, I think, from the things that people are going to talk about tonight, that um, core community values such as community collaboration and social change, social inclusion and empowerment are all reflected in the work of, of these presenters tonight. So what we're going to do is um, give an overview each person of the diverse work they do in, in um, to reduce isolation, to empower and foster connectedness and well-being within New South Wales communities, um, largely but not completely in the Sydney area. And um, then um, people will speak for about five or six minutes. Um, we won't interrupt them for questions then so that we can allow a decent time for um questions and discussion later on, because it is a round table and not a symposium. Um, but you are welcome to put any any um, comments into the chat room if you want us and questions that we can pick up on, um, feedback as you go, responses or questions that we can follow up later on. Um, okay, I think that's probably all that I want to say. I, as I said, I'm Heather and I'm in Melbourne, so I'm not the focus of this session, but I'm really pleased that um, our five presenters have been able to get together despite all the obstacles of disconnection and such and probably illustrate some of the themes that they're talking about just in the way that they themselves have got together as well. So we're going to start off with Marley um, who had to who get here um, on her almost yes had to hitch a ride almost or get, get her car jump started to get here. So I hope that you've got your breath back Marley and we can hand over to you now. Great thanks Heather. I'm going to um uh, ooh, put a timer on to time myself so I don't take too long. But if I do, just don't hesitate to let me know. Um, so hi everyone, I'm I'm Marley, as I said before, and I work at the Matul Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. 
um, where I'm a postdoctoral research fellow. And I suppose um, I came to community psychology when uh, doing working with Elizabeth, who's also on the call um, as an RA and doing my PhD. Um, not that I think we called it that at the time, but it felt like a lot of the research was that um, the focus was in looking at the way that people, I suppose, were unable to be disconnected from the communities and um, particularly around um, people experiencing homelessness. So I found uh, most of my research interests have taken a kind of community psychology bent. And I've been lucky to be able to, even though I now work in a centre that has, um, I don't think anyone would has heard of community psychology, although I keep on talking about it, um, they're, they're very focused on kind of clinical psychology and individual um, models of mental health. But they, I have been able to kind of poke holes in this and start projects looking at the social and community-based determinants of mental health and substance use during COVID, um, doing mixed method studies, looking at um, things like space and place and how that impacts mental health. So that's been really interesting. But I wanted to talk about my um, PhD research today, um, which because it kind of reflects most strongly with our theme of isolation and connection which explored the experience of loneliness amongst people with lived experience of homelessness in the greater Sydney region. So I became interested in the topic when I was working as an RA with Elizabeth, surveying and interviewing 75 chronically homeless men over their first two years housed. Um, and so what I found is that while a lot of the men experienced um, a lot of wraparound support and a very structured system of case management, many described themselves as feeling lonely in their housing. And so for some, uh, loneliness drove them to make decisions that compromise their tendency, like returning back to homeless friends or connections that they had from before, or even sometimes inviting other people with destructive kind of habits to come and live with them. Um, and this made me want to better understand what loneliness was for this group. So how they understood it, um, what factors were associated with it, um, and, and how they really made sense of it. And I did this through a mixed methods approach. So interviewing 16 really diverse um, uh, people who had experienced homelessness. Um, and then I went on to try and um, create um, measures and understand how loneliness and its different facts were related to it um, quantitatively. So what I found was, and I think that these things are probably, well, I know they are threaded through a lot of the presentations today, but I found that people's loneliness was driven um, largely by the change in social identity that occurred when people became homeless and an absence of the critical and important social networks that they really valued in their lives. So most people knew that to become homeless meant that they were, or they would be stigmatized and judged by those in the outside world, the people they really cared about. So many responded by detaching themselves from pre-homeless friends and family out of a sense of shame or to prevent these connections from thinking negatively about them. Um, and many already had strained and damaged relationships with friends and family. And so they didn't really often have this great base or relational base to start from. And some um, in there, when talking to them, um, seemed to internalize the stigma around homelessness and talked about themselves and other people that were in a similar situation to them quite negatively. Um, so despite um, uh, the situation that they're in, many people had many friends who were in a similar housing situation to them, although these relationships were often um, pretty transient um, based on kind of uh, the institutions that they were in. So for instance, a lot of places have um, a kind of deadlines or, or kind of caps around how long you can spend there, and they were of poor quality. So uh, participants' identities uh, that they had prior to homelessness also influenced how well they were able to cope socially um, during homelessness and how isolated they felt. So I found that those who came from backgrounds of social disadvantage often described feeling more satisfied and a greater belonging within homeless social networks, whereas those who came from um, backgrounds of social, social privilege often described feeling uh, pretty unsatisfied or isolated within these networks. And for them, the networks that they really wanted to connect with and the ones they really valued were their pre-homeless friends that they'd often detached from. And unfortunately, these issues with isolation often persisted way beyond homelessness uh, into housing. So some participants described 
um, managing the isolation through creating new um, kind of vibrant social roles and identities within um, their lives. So, um, so even though they didn't have often control over who they would interact with because um, they really wanted to connect with their pre-homeless friends and family, they were able to control their social worlds and get positive identities by controlling who they did have um, or the kind of world they did have access to. So some described spending, had spending time with service providers or social groups like church or long balls communities, help them to maintain a positive sense of themselves and their own identity. Um, in I won't go too deeply into it, but in the quantitative findings, I found that um, these relationships with service providers and other communities, while really important for the sense of self, uh, didn't really negate the effect of loss that they had from their pre-existing relationships like with family and friends. So to sum up, I think it was a really interesting mix of understanding that pe uh, people's experiences of their identities through homelessness um, uh, in interaction with the kind of loss of critical valued networks um, within a broader context of marginalization really um, uh, kind of captured people's experiences of loneliness. And it's only once we look at all those factors in combination when helping people or speaking or supporting people in this environment that things are likely to change. Thank you, Marley. That was a great presentation. I don't know how you managed to get all of that into six minutes. I'm really impressed. So I'm going to hand straight over to Brona so that she can pick up where you left off and we'll all be picking up on the themes that are running through these presentations. Thank you, Brona. Thank you. Uh, so I'd spoken a little bit uh, about some of the challenges uh, in terms of health and well-being that are faced in rural, regional and remote communities. Um, and, and certainly we, we've become increasingly aware of those. But I also wanted to highlight uh, that these are often places of innovation. And certainly uh, we, we see the pioneering of models of different ways of working in order to address some of the challenges that are associated with the tyranny of distance. And to give you a recent example across the country, including in uh, major cities, out of necessity, we've had this massive uptake of telehealth and telemedicine. But in reality, we've been delivering remote chemotherapy up in Mount Isa for years now. And in fact, in some areas of the country, this is very a uh, teleconsultation with your specialist is in fact the, the norm. So I think it's, it's always worth um, pointing out uh, the aspects of innovation as well. And we're very lucky. We now have a foundation of knowledge to help guide us in, in the brave new world. And uh, a lot of my work uh, has concerned the, the health and well-being of young people uh, in regional, rural and remote areas with diverse sexual and or uh, gender identities and practice. It's often put under the umbrella. It's a very ill-fitting umbrella of LGBT or LGBTQ young people. Um, and I think that really, I mean, in terms of isolation, if we think about it, often young people in these areas, they are fearful about the risks associated with being out. There's often a less visible LGBT presence and community and generally less services. So I think you can appreciate how some of those factors uh, the, the impact uh, of some of those factors upon isolation. And I really just wanted to share with you today a, a couple of insights uh, from a project. And I was a co-supervisor on this project and it was a bit of work done by a fantastic, fantastic researcher as part of her honors project. She was interested in looking at online mental health services and how these could be engaged with by LGBT young people in rural, regional and remote areas. So she spoke with service providers and she spoke with young people. And uh, here are a couple of the things um, that I learned. The first one being the internet alone will not save us. So <laughs> certainly even where we have good coverage, reach becomes a much more complicated issue when we think about privacy, sharing of devices within households. And uh, certainly one of the insights from the young people was it's not enough to engage us. You need to be talking to our parents. You need to be reaching out to schools. You need to be um, engaging with the community. And I think that's a really poignant reminder, um, for, certainly in my work, to be very wary and to, and to resist quite individualizing approaches and to start moving towards whole of community responses 
uh, to some of these issues. Uh, the, other, uh, the other aspect that was raised by young people and service providers alike was that young people need to be at the heart um, of the process of designing. In other words, co-design. They need to be invited to the table in order for these services to reach them and to be effective. And uh, certainly in thinking about how communities uh, and the services landscape and, and how we engage with it is changed forever. I think just some of these issues, they highlight the really important contribution that we as community psychologists and community activists and researchers uh, can make in going forward. That's me. Thank you, that's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, you raised some things that I, I hadn't heard said before in terms of that sort of mixed blessing of the things that can, the innovative things about a rural community and also the fact that, that the internet does not save you completely. <laughs> so much is loaded on that, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're well, moving right along. We're going to hand over to Wafa to talk about her work within the Muslim communities. I think you can start to get a sense of some of the threads here. Thank okay. you, Wafa. Thank you, Heather. Um, Heather, I think I'd have to start by saying that I've been very, very fortunate um, over the last three decades to work in a very rich multicultural environment as a psychologist and as a researcher. Um, and through that time, I've experienced firsthand the face of marginalisation and exclusion of devalued identities on the one hand, and on the other hand, efforts made towards community building and, and inclusion. And my research work has largely focused on the Muslim community, young people, women, men, refugees, new migrants, people who have been here for a very long time, gen over generations. Um, and generally I focused on experiences of belonging identity agency and factors which enable communities to feel empowered and healthy. And much of this research has occurred in, very, in a very challenging set of contexts. And it includes moments like the Gulf Wars 1 and 2, the, the security agenda post 9-11, terrorist events worldwide, narratives about borders, refugees and asylum seekers, narratives about citizenships and values and a debate which was framed, uh, which framed men as unworthy as Australian citizens, um, political narratives which posed Muslims as a unique problem in Australia. And of course, the Cronulla riots in 2005, which posited that Lebanese and Muslim men were unwelcome and alien. Uh, with, a re with a beach reclaimed as white territory. Amidst all of this, I, I think I have to acknowledge that Muslim communities, together with Australian Indigenous communities, have been and continue to be overly researched. Some of my work with academics who work with Australian Muslim communities revealed a range of motivations for such work. All were acutely aware of socio-political environment the socio-political environment that their research was positioned in and there was a spectrum of responses into how they saw themselves in this field from being an objective observer to wanting to disrupt assumptions wanting to impact on social change and government policy and to assist communities to feel empowered through the research process in terms of my research noting that the australian muslim community is not one monolith it is extremely diverse I have found that there are a number of recurring common themes and they include things like Muslims playing, placing great importance on family ties and community linkages, on Islamic values which they see as positive and consistent with Australian and universal values, and they're concerned and distressed about being singled out and discriminated against, negatively stereotyped. They speak of a strong sense of belonging, even if they're not perceived as such, and they welcome contributing to society, being of service in a collaborative and constructive way. However, members of the Australian communities also grapple with difficult external situations such as terrorism and racism, which unfortunately is on the rise these days. In a pilot study that I conducted about the reactions of a small group of Australian Muslims to terrorist events around the world, reveals an experience of a range of emotions, of thoughts and of, of behaviours. People spoke of their feelings of sadness and anguish, of anger and frustration, of vulnerability and stuckness, of hypervigilance and cautiousness in public. Yet, I, and I, I feel strongly about this point, that perhaps in spite of and despite the negative social experiences of Islamophobia, 
of harsh and racist political and media narratives about Australian Muslims. My observation as an observer, um, as a researcher, as a member of the community and as a clinician is that people and communities utilize their agency to forge on. This is despite or regardless of the roadblocks and in spite of and in rejection of the nastiness of other discourse. And here I'd like to take a few moments just to social, social, show some pictures. So I'm going to try and um, share my screen, if you just bear with me. Um, I've got to remember how to do that. <laughs> Monica, I think it's there. Okay, here we go. Now, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do this because I've, um, here we go. So what I wanted to do was to actually just show some examples of despite and in spite of all of these negative um, sort of uh, negative narratives that people do show their agency, that they, they you know, that, that things emerge spontaneously within communities. They don't necessarily have to be organised from above or by governments, that communities and individuals take on responsibility for things themselves. And um, so I just want to highlight maybe three or four examples and this is um, some of the drought responses that we've had uh, in uh, in uh, New South Wales where um, there were lots of um, prayers in different places and and friendship tours that were taken out to rural communities here I don't know whether you can see this one but um, a group went out to Kuna Barabran to um, to show some support with some friends they had out there where they hadn't received uh, rain in many many months and um, so communal prayers being made in different places around the place. Sorry to interrupt, Wafa, but um, your slide was there and then it disappeared. So okay. I, I wonder if you could... Can you see it again? Um, no, there's just a black, black screen. So try it again. Okay, here we go. One more time. There we are. Can you see there that? There it is. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a, there's a, a picture there of um, people heading off to Kuna Barabran and at the crossroads there with the Akrupa hat, which is <laughs> quite iconic for Australia anyway. But um, lots of lots of prayer um, uh, prayers for rain and um, trips taken out to different different places to show solidarity through the drought. Now I'm just going to try and move this along. Yeah. So here in terms of the bushfires again, um, you know, people just spontaneously organised for water, water to be taken to um, places like Lake Conjola that, have, you know, had received a huge battering in terms of the bushfires. People went out to organise um, barbecues and food for, for communities and for firefighters. And um, here you've got uh, a story about um, from the ABC uh, about a, uh, some ma Muslim men who um, were adopted by a, a small country town. In terms of COVID, there's been a lot of activity. Um, Muslims generally um, who are in a position to, to sort of give charity usually, um, you know, can find lots and different ways uh, to contribute. And in fact, the community came together in a big way during Ramadan to, to feed um, uh, a lot of people, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims, anyone who, who um, was in need. And in some of those projects are continuing till today. Um, and I think there were record 18 organisations that spontaneously um, got together and organised uh, in New South Wales. And this one, um, this is, this is, a, this is um, a little bit different. This is a, a group that started after the, um, the, the, um, oh, the narratives about bikinis in uh, France and um, women organised themselves spontaneously as the first off as the burkini babes and later they became the swim sisters um, because they wanted to broaden out what it is that they um, uh, uh, the sort of contribution that they were making in in the field in terms of supporting women Muslim women non-Muslim women children's programs, health programs, and they even, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a man there. There's a whole, I think four, four people have been trained as lifesavers. They've well and truly reclaimed claimed the beach and the iconogra iconography of what it is to be Australian with the lifesaver. Um, and <laughs> they've helped um, some brothers to establish the Swim Brothers group as well. 
as women sometimes do. Anyway, that's all for me. Thank you, Wafa. That's great. I was thinking of the surf therapy session that was an earlier today, and uh, maybe you should have been at that too. Um, but also for those people probably remember the Cronulla riots and how what, how um, vicious that was, and and what a lovely example that is of 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 reframing that as a positive within the Muslim community in terms of claiming the beach in a in a giving back way. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay, um, moving right on to Meg, Meg Smith, who's going to talk about strategies developed by community workers to rebuild um, social and emotional support for people recovering from episodes of mental ill health. So thank you, Meg, and you need to unmute yourself. And I'm right anybody, in. I think I'm unmuted. Am I you unmuted? Are now. Yes, okay. Um, on I'll, now. Just up, I'll just pick up on some of the themes that um, Waffa and Rona and Marley have raised. And Waffa, I thought the themes that came out of yours were, you know, what are the factors which enable communities to be enabled and powerful? Um, and I thought your presentation about the uh, the bushfire victims and the and certainly the sort of the surfing one is what are the community needs and how can your group offer positive skills and services? Um, and Brona, a couple of the sort of points you raised about identity and, um, and one of the issues in, in any kind of social action is how do you build positive identity? How do you get people to embrace what might have been a negative identity to being a positive strength-based identity? Um, and Marley, with your work on homelessness, um, you know, you, your kind of physical location, your geography, how does that impact on your interaction with other people and how can you build networks in people who are geographically displaced? So, um, well, my background is I came in from the Master of Psychology at the University of New South Wales and it was a clinical master's degree, but, but we had Robin Winkler and we had one farmer um, <laughs> who kind of took us a bit further than um, um, the clinical psychology paradigm of the day. So I came out of that and started working in women's health and not just women's health, it was a radical feminist women's health collective and really started looking at, you know, how you, um, how you reach women who have been very isolated, what are the factors in that isolation, but also the political ideology of, look, well, you know, if it's happening to you, it's happening to other people, you know, health issues are normal, um, you have a right to access good health services. You have a right to complain about health services. Um, and the groups, and I think I came to recognise that the groups that were successful were um, people who had access to education to start with. So some awareness of, you know, where you fit into the political and economic and social reality of the world and what resources you have in terms of, you know, your language, your skills and access to people who can, you know, give you a push along if you like. Things were going fine until I had a episode of severe mental illness and I got plunged into the mental health system, which in the seventies was kind of like, you know, going back in time to the Dickensian era. So here I was in a big psychiatric hospital, um, um, they basically said, you've got a mental illness, um, you've got to take this medication for the rest of your life, um, and as soon as you're no longer a danger to yourself or to other people, we'll, we'll let you out. Um, and if you don't stop, if you stop taking medication, we'll drag you back to hospital again. And I thought, hey, shit, you know, I'm a psychologist, I'm learned counselling, um, what about, you know, kind of stress reduction methods, um, what about sort of learning something about, you know, this particular illness. No, no, there was none of that, no counselling. And I remember asking the psychiatrist, well, look, you know, my family need some help here to understand what's going on. Oh, no, no, that's not relevant. So, you know, families just weren't included in this. It was your problem. It's biochemical. Take these pills. Everything will be hunky-dory. So... Um, <laughs> I set up a support group, you know, like I'm a psychologist, I run, you know, therapy groups, I've had experience of therapy groups and what have you. And the group very quickly became a social action group. Um, at the time, the mental health 
legislation in New South Wales has been reformed. There were a number of scandals going on um, in New South Wales and in other states in Australia about the treatment of people living in you know, mental hospitals, basically. And there were sort of reforms going on in looking after people with disabilities and what kind of government support would people with disabilities actually have. So the so-called therapy support group became a social action group and we started writing submissions to government and we started lobbying mental health services and and there was a general movement going on in New South Wales and also particularly in New Zealand at that time um, and I certainly learned a lot from um, people in New Zealand about the strategies they used to uh, actually improve mental health services and start to change the dialogue around mental health and mental illness. Um, I guess um, for me, the, the issues that are current, I still work in the mental health area in, in the, on the mental health tribunal. And some of the issues that I think are still really current, and this links into um, the community psychology sort of theme really is there are still cultural stereotypes and stigma by mental health service providers. And, and in particular, I think um, people from non-English speaking backgrounds whose families may not have good English are particularly disadvantaged in mental health. Um, so, you know, we see people coming into hospital. Um, we see that, you know, here's a young man who's got schizophrenia. Here's, you know, a daughter who's got depression. Here's mum who's, um, you know, having um, psychotic symptoms and what have you. And the families still are not getting very much in the way of education and support about, well, okay, here's a person with a disability. How do we actually support that person? You know, what services are actually available? Um, I guess when I first started learning about, you know, culturally different groups, and I think in New South Wales, and Waffa, you might correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but we've got something like 28 different community languages in New South Wales. So the whole issue of how do you make information available in a language that people can actually understand and relate to. Um, and that's an ongoing issue. And I think, um, um, I think one of the points, um, Bruno, that you made is, well, the internet helps, but it's not the whole answer. That really what helps is local groups, face-to-face -face groups, a bit difficult in the time of COVID, I know, but actually getting people together um, to build up a positive identity in their own community and to enable communities to support people living with mental health issues in their own community. Um, and I think, um, uh, Marley, I think you raised the point actually about um, regional areas. Um, and one of the things we found was that we started setting up support groups in regional areas in New South Wales, but we came up across the stigma kind of idea that, well, okay, yes, I'm living in Wagga Wagga, but I don't want anybody else in the town to know that I have a mental illness. So um, people would travel to a support group in another region, just so nobody in their region would actually know that they had, had a mental illness. So we started looking at the, um, the whole concept of positive identity and Marinda Epstein, who's a cartoonist um, and also a psychiatric survivor, um, has come up with a number of images of, okay, you know, we can actually change the language. Um, we can actually change the way things are looked at. Um, we can move away from the poverty model of, it's a mental illness, it's biochemical, take these pills, and if you don't, you're naughty, to a more embracing concept of, um, mental health, which can't be divorced from the environment you're in and the people who are around you and the support networks that need to be provided. So I'm going to leave it there because I forgot to put my timer on, so, <laughs> so I'm not sure. <laughs> I was just about to come in there, Meg, you just got there. <laughs> Thank you for that comment too, well, for that you've put in the, um, in the in the chat room, which people can have a look at. All right, so Elizabeth, you're the last cab off the rank and um, we still should have some time for discussion. And I think Meg has in some ways provided us with some of the discussion by 
making the connections between the, some of the previous presentations. So over to you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Meg. Okay, so I will try to be super quick so that we have time for discussion. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, okay, I hope everybody can see that. Um, this is uh, this is an animation um, that um, produced by one of my students that I've supervised um, over the past 12 to 18 months, Ariana Kamen. I put her website up there so that you can go and have a look at the animations. Um, the research I wanted to speak about tonight reflects on the social networks of people with chronic substance use problems and how drug and alcohol and other health services um, inadvertently become part of those networks, yet this is rarely acknowledged or leveraged. Um, chronic substance use can be an alien, a very alienating experience and it can leave a trail of destruction and loss across a person's family, their friendships and community. And substance misuse can also come out of a, out of a background of broken down or abusive relationships, um, which often means that people come into treatment without the kinds of social connections that they need to recover. And thus recovery from substance dependence often necessitates the remaking or the remodeling of social connections. Um, this, however, is a challenge in a healthcare system still dominated by the biomedical model of addiction. And I'll come back to this point in a minute, hopefully. I've got time. Um, in some of the research I've been undertaking with drug health services in southwestern Sydney, we found that not only were people's social networks quite small and, comp and comprised um, few close confidence, but that the relationships they did have um, often involved conflict. Um, interestingly, they um, were also perceived as, as dependable relationships and experienced overall as quite satisfying. So this paints um, quite a complex picture of how people's social networks are constructed in that transition from a drug using lifestyle to one of recovery. The qualitative interviews um, that we conducted suggested a deliberate move towards smaller friendship groups as part of that recovery, initial recovery process. For some participants, this involved maintaining social distance from other users. Um, for others, it involved new friendships that were centered around the drug and alcohol treatment. And while we specifically asked participants not to include healthcare providers um, when answering the questions about their social network, these relationships invariably featured in the quality, qualitative accounts. Um, and so this, these findings um, come up repeatedly across my research with um, my research with um, people who are homeless, those with substance use problems, and some of my research in clinical work with people seeking asylum. Um, and I think it raises a couple of questions. One is around how services can actually gear themselves up to address um, the sense of loss um, and the barriers to that perceived sense of belonging that um, people um, bring with them into services, particularly when services constrained um, around these notions of efficiency um, and time limited support. Um, and just picking up on um, what Meg mentioned um, and some of the other speakers have talked about and is around this, the um, level of stigma that exists um, and is felt by um, clients coming into treatment, um, not just from, their, from the community at large, but also within their drug using community and then again within the healthcare system. I think one of the challenges that we face um, is the lack of training for health practitioners to directly address um, these in a way that, that um, starts to challenge some of those assumptions that the biomedical model or framework puts around substance use and allows them to actually step outside of their roles to engage in some of some of this work um, while still, I guess, meeting the, the, the requirements, the funding requirements and the service deliverables that they, that they need to meet. Um, I'm going to stop it there so that we have some time um, for discussion. I hope that gives us a little bit more time, Heather. I need to unmute myself. Thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, 
I'm just going to switch myself to to gallery viewer so we can see I can see everybody rather than just the speaker. Um, I'd like to. We've only got. Oh, we're not doing too badly. We've actually got a whole ten minutes. So that was very well done. Um, so I'm just wondering if anybody would like to just share their reaction. Anybody who's been with us for the um, the duration would like to share their reaction to some some of what we've um, we've heard from our presenters. You just need to unmute yourself and go for it, or put a question in the chat room, whichever. And. And Monica, you're our host, but you're very welcome to participate too. You don't all, I think most of your work is done now, except to press stop recording when we get to the end. So you're allowed to, to actually participate. And of course, as the presenters, you might like to, I know that you have been meeting together, so you probably already know some of what each other has said, but you might like to um, respond to what each other said a bit in the way that Meg did when she had picked up themes from the pre previous speakers. So yeah, over to you. I want to talk about what the answer is to the kind of broader sense of isolation that we're talking about as people working in the space and I suppose I mean how if we're trying to create community for people through in different populations so talking about amongst people in rural regional areas people experiencing homelessness substance use um, people with as you say survivors of the psychiatric complex how do you how do we do that when we are often in disparate places ourselves how do we bridge that i think that's a really tough question mm -hmm. so yourselves are what you're working in isolation yourself it's kind of a parallel process yeah <laughs> yeah what, what what are the answers to that i mean i, I suppose it's finding a little niche for yourself but what i mean are there structures that can be put in place are there i don't know i'm interested to see what others have to say I think for me, when I first started working in women's health, I realised that my six years of psychology had not given me any training at all in community development and, um, you know, how to work with very diverse communities. Um, so I was on a very fast learning curve um, about how to produce information and how to uh, reach to other groups. And the women I was working with were very very creative and innovative and we had an Italian health worker and and she recognized that um, a lot of the women we were seeing um, at the center came from southern Italy and a lot of the women had never learned English that they'd come to Australia there were no um, English language classes that they could attend and besides you know the men were going out to work and the women were stuck at home so they didn't have access to it and, and she recognised that they were cut off from both Italy, that, you know, the magazines and the culture that was coming out of Italy, you know, it was kind of like, you know, 20 years ahead of um, the literature that was available in Australia. So we had these women who were generally in their, you know, 50s and 60s who had come to Australia as young women after World War II, um, who just weren't able to access information. So, um, so they would come into the centre and they would see the doctor and we had an interpreter. Um, but we just recognised that there was a whole area of, you know, how do you educate someone when there's just no resources out there in the community. So we started off having um, movie afternoons. So we'd get Italian movies and invite the women to come in to watch our Italian movie. Movies were pretty good, I thought. Um, and, you know, have coffee and Italian cakes and, and then kind of, you know, in effect, get health education classes going, um, you know, with that kind of discussion. So uh, we really had to think um, in fairly creative ways to say, OK, you know, what is it this particular group of people are lacking and it's access to information about healthcare in their own language. And, you know, very isolated from um, other parts of Australian society. How can we actually build up those communities? The other group we were working with um, were young gay women. And this was the inner west of um, Sydney. You know, there were a lot of um, young gay women, mainly who had come from country areas because of the stigma and, you know, um, inability to sort of come out, you know, as gay in a country area. So they'd come to Sydney and 
and they were seeking, um, you know, kind of support and help. And there was a kind of real issue with drug and alcohol issues with gay women because, you know, the only place you could meet other women was to go to the pub. So, and I remember going to the pub and you stand there and you drink and you stand there and you drink and you're too scared to sort of contact anybody or say hello to anybody or how do you sort of, you know, initiate a social interaction or what have you. <laughs> so, so we started, um, you know, running get-togethers. Um, so coffee afternoons, you know, for, for young women who wanted to link up with other young women um, um, and, you know, make the connections that way. So within the context of a health centre, we were in effect saying, well, okay, what are the needs and how we can facilitate the social interaction. And I guess what came out of that was recognising that people do have the strength and resources within themselves if they're given support to access those resources. So, um, so we really didn't do anything in those groups other than provide the coffee and the movies and whatever. Uh, but, you know, kind of in effect recognising that, you know, healthy people, um, given the opportunity, will will come up with their own ideas. And Waffle, I think that's what's so impressive about your community, um, that the Muslim community has, you know, immense strength and resources. And, and you latch into that to um, reach out to other communities in crisis. It's a long tradition too. It's about, also about um, how people make sense of community and how they make a sense of belonging. And, um, and it's not something that's you know, imposed from above. It's something that happens quite um, spontaneously and in, in a way that it's very grassroots. I think I put that up on the slide. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what you were talking about, Meg, reminded me um, when I used to work in community, <laughs> in community work um, yonks ago, I mean, way back when, um, SBS was, uh, 2EA radio was the multicultural radio that we used to have. And it worked wonders in terms of getting messages out to people. Um, because if people were illiterate in their own languages, at least they could hear and, and learn about things that way. But the cup of coffee does amazing things. <laughs> Even getting people in the front door at the school to attend the school meetings. Um, depending on which community you're talking about. Yes, but the cup, cup of coffee is amazing. I, I think, um, I just, Mali, about the, the, the connection, were you sort of thinking more about w the worker, the person who's actually working and the isolation that perhaps is, um, that they might meet working in remote places or in areas that aren't so, that, was that part of the question as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just interested in the way that they interconnected. I mean, like the, I, I suppose that I like the, well, it was interesting, the thought that in building community for people, for different communities, or as Meg says, um, facilitating or supporting communities to kind of um, develop on their own strengths. How do we create more of a, a community spirit amongst what is traditionally a non-community focused discipline in psychology? How, I mean, how do we, especially in research, I suppose is what I'm saying as well. I mean, apart from just planting seeds in places and hope that people notice and listen, um, is there something more systemic that can be done to change that? And I don't know what it would look like. I suppose I'm just thinking about it. What possibilities could be there? I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, one of the things that I've been aware of over the years of going to APS conferences where there's always a minority, obviously, of community psychologists, but but I always felt like we were swinging against the tide, but we weren't the only ones. So there would be the women in psychology people or people like, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, Ian, uh, I should know, from University of Adelaide, Ian John who was writing in the late, used to write something in every Australian psychologist about critiquing the discipline and such. And he was, articles were very hard to read, but whenever we were in a session, whether it was on Aboriginal psychology, the same people would turn up. 
and you'd have the sense that these were people who had shared values, even like yourselves were working in different content areas, somehow that all trot along to the same thing. So we became like that body of fish that becomes a school of fish that's swimming against the tide. And actually, it doesn't really matter if the tide's going the other way, if you've got enough of you. So um, I think it's just great that the, um, and this is probably a note that we have to finish on, um, a great that the that the five or six of you have actually managed to find each other. And I think that that mention of food is, um, is I've always thought that food and coffee will bring people together and maybe wine, um, if, if that's appropriate. Um, but yeah, and uh, I, if I can just finish, there was a, I worked in community health also in the eighties and we had a community health nurse named Glennis who was um, from the local community. So the, the, when we started the community health center, people would come to it because Sister Quick worked there because she used to be the, the um, district nurse and she got a bit of a shock when she found out that she wasn't going to be wearing her uniform anymore. But she made the best cream puffs. And so whenever we ran a group for mothers who were feeling isolated or whatever, Glennis would bring the cream puffs at one to one session. And she also started a group for German speaking people in Melton and anybody who does Melton, which is in the far west of Melbourne, a bit like Western Sydney, there are not many German speaking people but they found a couple who were very isolated, put a notice in the local paper and said, anybody else out there speak German? And suddenly they had a group and they would go walking and, and such. So they created their own little niche group of German speaking people in Melton who supported each other. So maybe there's a metaphor in that too. Okay, we should finish, shouldn't we, Monica? And thank you all. Um, can I just mention that the next session on arts and community and mental health, um, if Tristan Fraser starts with the same quote that she started on the session last week that we had, it absolutely is going to hit on some of what you've talked about. For me, loneliness is not an isolated problem and we're starting to treat it like a disease. It's wonderful that it's getting attention, but it's not a disease. It's a social community problem. It's not an individual problem. And the quote that she will start her presentation on says it far better than I can. So I'd suggest you flip over there at least for the for her presentation. Okay, thank you all very much. It's been a very rich time and uh, thank you to those of you who stayed with us and we'd love any feedback um, that you can put somewhere along the way. Um, we've got some feedback there. Somebody from Townsville in North Queensland who probably is a long way away from a lot of community psychology. So thank you, Megan. Um, oh, good to see you. There you go. Yeah. And um, thanks. A long everyone. way up to the point. <laughs> a long way up to the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to see. We've actually got a leaf who's here is moving back to Cairns very soon. So you might be able to link up with her because it's just a stone's throw, isn't it? Townsville, Cairns, all the same. <laughs> 24 hours away. That's right. Okay. Oh, no, There's a the leaf. There's a the leaf. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll finish up now. And thank you, especially to our presenters. Can we give them all a wave or what did we do them? Jazz hands or, you know, thumbs up or whatever. I think you were fantastic. Thank you. And I'm amazed that you all got through <laughs> five speakers in that time. Thank you, Heather. And thank you, Monica. Yes. 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 Thank, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated.